Every New Year's Eve, raising a glass of champagne to the peal of the Kremlin chimes, Misha thought about how many women he had killed in the last 12 months, recalling the last seconds of each of their lives. I've done so much and they still haven't found me, he thought. In his pocket lay a screwdriver with barely visible traces of blood on it. He stroked it gently and a smile appeared on his face. The one for which he was nicknamed Misha the Smile. In eastern Siberia, where the Kitoy River meets the Angara River, stands the city of Angarsk. This relatively small city with a population of just over 200,000 is located 40 kilometers from Irkutsk, the capital of the region, which is three times the size of Angarsk. Irkutsk is populated by Russians, Burats, and Tatars, who practice Orthodox Christianity, Buddhism, and Islam, respectively. Compared to Irkutsk, Angarsk is quite nondescript at first sight. Nonetheless, in 2005 and 2008, it won the title of Most Comfortable City in Russia, while in 2013, it was named the cleanest. It seems like a city inhabited by happy and carefree people, but only to an outsider. The locals are well aware of the dark inner workings of the seemingly quiet town. Ungarsk was founded in the midst of the Siberian taiga soon after the Second World War. Here, the winters are snowy and harsh, and the summers are very short. It was in this faraway place that the Soviet regime decided to establish a secret chemical industry and set up an oil refinery. Because of this, Angarsk became known as the city of petrochemists. Soviet newspapers wrote that the city was built by war veterans. But that was a lie. It was actually built by people of a dubious and unenviable reputation, exiled prisoners. This is a fact that is generally not talked about. Nonetheless, fate hasn't allowed the city's residents to completely forget about their past. There are still several penal colonies around Angarsk, the legacy of the Soviet times. It used to be a common occurrence to meet a former inmate among the locals. People freed from the Gulag had lived in Angarsk since the 60s. In the preceding years, tens of thousands were sent to camps, mostly for their perceived lack of loyalty to the regime. This was an ordeal that not everyone survived. Many died from diseases and injuries without receiving basic medical care. Those who lived to tell the tale were pretty much superhuman, incredibly tough people that seemed able to weather any hardship. Among those who tried to start a new life in Angarsk were people who had gone through hell and were desperate and oftentimes cruel, which affected the general atmosphere of the city. In the 90s, a wave of violence swept through Angarsk, with robberies, fights, rape and murder being committed so often they could have filled all the pages of the local newspapers. Reckless men banded together into gangs and criminal syndicates fighting in the streets, torturing people in cellars. Any resident of the city could become their victim. Curiously enough, in those days the most dangerous job was not that of a policeman or firefighter, but that of a kiosk vendor. The thug's favorite targets for robbery were stalls that sold newspapers or cigarettes. At some point in the 90s, women started to go missing in Angarsk. At first, nobody paid any particular attention. Lots of people go missing in Russia every year, so what? But their number continued to grow, and at some point, it became impossible to turn a blind eye to what was going on. An investigation was launched. At the time, hardly anyone could have imagined that it would continue for nearly 20 years. The year 1998 will go down in the memory of most Russians as the year of a great economic crisis. But only a month before the market crashed, the whole of Angarsk was a bus with a completely different story. On July 18, 1998, 
A diesel locomotive driver was on his way to work the night shift at the Trudevaya railway station near Angarsk. He was walking quietly along the tracks when suddenly he noticed something in the grass that looked like a mannequin. As he came closer, he saw a naked woman. She was young, no more than 25 years old. An alcoholic, the driver grumbled to himself, squeamishly covered her up with some clothes he found at the station and left her there, hoping she would soon come to her senses and go home. Once his shift ended, the men decided to pay a visit to the place where he had found the naked woman. This time, he realized that it wasn't alcohol after all. The woman's face was badly swollen. She tried saying something to him, but couldn't. The driver called an ambulance. The woman's name was Natalia Titova, and she was in a critical state. The doctors discovered multiple stab wounds on her head, as if someone had taken a tailor's awl and tried to make a colander out of the poor woman's skull. When her relatives were found, it turned out that they had already been searching for her for two days. On the day before her disappearance, she had a falling out with her husband, the 23-year-old professional military man Dmitry Titov, to whom she had been married for three years. On the day of their quarrel, Natalia and Dmitry went to a nearby lake to have a picnic with a few friends. A mutual acquaintance named Gennady drove them there. When the whole company returned home, Dmitry, having had too much alcohol, soon fell asleep, whereas Natalia ended up in bed with Gennady. Afterwards, she decided to go to a cafe, but her new lover refused to join her because of the late hour. When Dmitry Titov woke up at 5 a.m., his wife had already gone out. Unfortunately, the doctors couldn't save Natalia's life. She died in the intensive care unit without regaining consciousness. The police admitted that Natalia Titova's death was not an accident and launched an investigation. The detectives set out to determine what happened to Natalia the night she disappeared. They found out that Natalia had met a man in the street. He had stopped his car next to her. Presumably, the unfamiliar young man offered her a drink. Natalia didn't refuse, as she planned to be out and about until the morning. When the two were driving next to the railroad line, a conflict likely broke out between the driver and his passenger. The man dragged her out of the car, stabbed her several times in the head with an awl, leaving her there for about a day before the train driver found her. Natalia's husband and their friend, Gennady, immediately became suspects. The latter was less lucky because his bodily fluids were found on the victim's corpse. Both suspects underwent a face-to-face -face interrogation, during which Gennady, as was to be expected, denied having had a liaison with Natalia. Dmitry, too, didn't believe that his spouse had cheated on him, saying Gennady was allegedly not her type. Eventually, both men were released. The sense of terror that had shrouded the city of Angarsk soon faded away. The brutal murder of Natalia Titova remained unsolved, and the case soon went cold, just like another case four years earlier. In the fall of 1994, two teenage girls went missing in Angarsk. The 18-year-old Luba Chilugina and her friend, the 14-year-old Natasha. Luba was the eldest daughter in the large Chelugin family. She was one of those people of whom they say sharp as a tack. She knew how to stand up for herself, and by the age of 18 was fully responsible for her own life. Luba got a job at the Hazar Cafe, which was owned by people from the local Azerbaijani diaspora. Incidentally, one of the owners had tried to seduce the girl so he fell under the suspicion of the police when Luba disappeared. There were rumors that the man either confessed on his own or under torture, then retracted his confession and left for Azerbaijan, never to be seen again. There was another unpleasant page in the story of Luba's disappearance. Some people introduced themselves as her kidnappers and tried to extort a huge ransom from her mother. The grief-stricken woman was determined to sell her apartment to pay the money, prepared to do anything to get her daughter back alive. But it was pointless. 
When spring came and the snow melted, Luba's body was found in a clearing in the woods, next to that of the 14-year-old Natasha. The girls were probably brought here by car. After examining the remains, the coroner wrote in his report that Luba and Natasha most likely died from explosives to the head. Each skull had at least a dozen such marks. When the news of the teenager's violent murder swept through Angarsk, panic gripped its citizens. The husband of another woman found murdered at around the same time voiced a thought that nobody paid attention to for years and that many were even skeptical of. This could only have been done by someone who works in the police, he had said darkly. This thought would stay with him till the very end. The idea that there was a serial killer in Angarsk was in the air as the memory of the cannibal Chikatilo was still fresh in the minds of people, but the police didn't take this version seriously. Even after several women in the late 90s had gone to the police after being attacked by a man named Mikhail, nobody bothered to connect the dots, even though their stories had a lot in common. On January 27, 1998, the 17-year-old Svetlana Misevichus was at her birthday party with her girlfriends. Late in the evening, she decided it was time for her to go home, but walking would be too long and too dangerous, so Sveta decided to get a cab or hitch a ride. When a car pulled up beside her, the assertive behavior of the driver disconcerted her a bit, but once he showed her his police ID, she calmed down. She would casually glimpse at the driver during the ride, so she remembered that he had an aquiline nose. Unfortunately, she could not remember anything else, because the police officer beat her nearly to death. Svetlana was found on the roadside by a chance passerby. She lay lifeless in the snow, so she was sent to the morgue, which was where she regained consciousness. Like in a horror movie, the first thing she saw was a tag on her own pale and stiff legs, the sort of tag they put on all bodies in morgues. Next to her lay several other bodies, which unlike her would never wake up again. Sveta screamed. The morgue workers found her and arranged for her to be taken to hospital, where she was soon transferred to the ICU in which she would spend several weeks. She was diagnosed with organic personality disorder, a consequence of severe head trauma. She will spend the rest of her life in the psychiatric ward. Even though the assault on Svetlana became the grounds for a large investigation, the culprit couldn't be found. Meanwhile, the attacks on young women continued. In July 1999, a young woman named Yevgenia Protasova Karilova made friends with several guys and went over to their place. After a while, she decided to go home and was escorted by her new acquaintances to an intersection. Another version of events suggests that her boyfriend had left her, so she decided to return home on her own. A car stopped next to her, the driver introduced himself as Mikhail and offered to give her a lift home. At first, she refused, but the stranger showed his police ID, after which she took the offer. The building where Yevgenia lived wasn't situated far from that intersection, but the man drove past it and, without saying a word, continued on towards the forest. When they arrived, he told Yevgenia to get out of the car. Sensing something was very wrong, she took off as soon as the car door opened. The man dashed after her and soon caught up. He hit her over the head several times and she lost consciousness. Yevgenia woke up in a hospital in Irkutsk. Almost immediately, she started relating the events of the past night. I started running away, took off my shoes, but I didn't manage to get away. I knew immediately that he was trying to kill me. I think he started strangling me, but I can't remember it. Yevgenia would recall later in a conversation with journalists. Why with them? Because in the police, nobody believed her account, thinking she was just delirious. In the meantime, the investigation that was launched after what happened with Svetlana Misevichus still continued. The detectives had to access archival documents from the past several years, 
and pour through them in an attempt to find similar cases of assault. They also decided to make a profile of the potential killer. This job was taken up by Nikolai Kitaev, who had worked with many serial killers and was an expert in the field. Before him, none of these murders were put together into a series for a rather banal reason. There were so many crimes being committed in Angarsk at the time that finding similar ones was seen as too difficult. Nonetheless, Kitaev managed it. He singled out 24 cases in which all of the victims were women who were out late at night and under the influence of alcohol. Kitaev also established a fact that was rather unpleasant for the local police department. The cases of missing persons were being handled rather carelessly. Negligence was obvious in the protocols and case reports. Nobody had been vetting the force. Part of the physical evidence had been lost, and nobody was held responsible for all of this. Kitaev voiced his concerns about these findings and was immediately suspended from the investigation. By this point, he had already progressed far in his research. The experienced detective suspected that the maniac could be a member of the police force, but not a high-ranking one. Here's how Kitaev came to this conclusion. In some cases, condoms with sperm were found at the crime scene. At the time, DNA testing was already in use, but it wasn't yet widespread, so the perpetrator wasn't aware of the new technology, otherwise he'd be more careful. Another woman that survived the unknown man's assault was Ludmila Smushlaeva, a local Ungarsk resident. She was driven out to a cemetery and found there later. It's unclear how this could have happened, but the police didn't even start investigating the case. The sense of impunity and the sluggishness of the local police went to the killer's head, spurring his bloodthirst. He attacked again and again. Interestingly enough, the Moscow authorities only found out about the series of violent murders in 2002 after the journalist Mark Deitch wrote a piece about the Ungarsk women titled The Wednesday Murderer. Eventually, the story reached the Prosecutor General's office and high-ranking officials from the Ministry of Internal Affairs. They sent a group of their people out to the vast expenses of Siberia. Their assignment was to create a separate investigation team that was to help finally catch the serial killer. This team was headed by renowned Moscow detective Valery Kostarev and Lieutenant Colonel Sergei Derjavin, senior commissioner of the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Most of the other places on the team were filled by the locals, people who knew the neighborhood and the city well. The 19-year-old Artem Dubinin who would later play a major role in the investigation, was part of this maniac team. Dubinin had only worked in the force for two months, having recently graduated from the Institute of the Ministry of Internal Affairs in Moscow. One time, as he was going down the hall, he bumped into his boss, who cheerily told him that Artem was to be sent to Ungarsk to work on catching the famous serial killer. Unfortunately, there was nothing honorable about this transfer. It was common to send the weakest employees to Ungarsk, either the young and inexperienced, or those considered lazy. Having only recently joined the force, Dubinin wasn't seen as a valuable employee, and this was a way of getting rid of him. Nobody expected the Ungarsk killer to actually get caught. After all this time, he became an urban legend, a boogeyman, just with a very real pile of dead bodies left in his wake. The investigation team consisted of a dozen operatives and an equal number of detectives. They were a motley crew, many having no desire to work in the maniac team, and some even trying to sabotage the investigation in order to get back to their usual departments and offices. The team began their work from scratch, if not from an even worse position, Remember how Kitaya found that the cases were being handled with great negligence? That's why the new team had to interrogate witnesses all over again. In the years 2003 and 2004, Detective Kostarev initiated genetic testing to determine the killer's genotype. The DNA profiles of the main suspects were sent to Moscow for comparison. 
But because this sort of testing was still time-consuming and expensive, they could only investigate five people a year. At this time, Kostarev and Derjavin got their first proper deputy in Angarsk. His name was Yuri Morozov, and he was an authoritative and experienced man who could keep the order while the head detective and the lieutenant colonel were in Moscow. Curiously, Derjavin had told Morozov from the very start that the team was being spied on and that their offices would often get bugged after visits from participants of the investigation that they had considered to be their own. At the time, arrival of people from Moscow wasn't seen as help, but as an examination, which was why the team was spied on so as not to throw anyone under the bus. The rumors about what was happening in the local police department very quickly reached the maniac. He decided to lay low. The attacks ceased, women stopped disappearing. But even this fact didn't give anyone the idea that one should conduct checks on people within the force itself. Instead, the investigators decided that the maniac had either died or was imprisoned for another crime. Let's get back to the maniac team. The young Artyom Dubinin turned out to be a talented fellow, and he was one of the few people involved in the investigation who actually wanted to find the killer. Artyom was slowly becoming more experienced. The team would occasionally help out with the investigation of other crimes in Angarsk and the surrounding area. During one such case, there was even an attempt on Dubinin's life, after which the entire team was allowed to carry firearms. The team described themselves as spies in a foreign country, since many of their colleagues in Angarsk treated them with hostility or even considered them traitors. Meanwhile, the understanding of how the killer operated had evolved. The investigators realized that for the murderer to drive around so many women at night without arousing suspicion, he must have been trustworthy. The stories of the survivors about the police ID and knowledge of the surrounding area only supported this hypothesis. But who could it have been? In 2009, Artyom Dubinin, by now an experienced detective, became head of the Maniac team. The case was transferred to the Siberian district, and a new detective by the name of Chernus joined the investigation. By that time, DNA testing had become quicker and more accessible, and the police were now able to conduct mass checks, getting DNA results on 400 people annually. Still, the work on the Ungar Skiller case seemed to be never-ending. The investigators compiled a list of about 30,000 potential suspects. Some matched the blood type from the DNA profile, others drove a Neva, the car model that the mysterious kidnapper was known to drive. Some witnesses also reported seeing a black foreign car. Later on, it would turn out that the killer had a black Honda Civic. And although there were also witnesses who claimed they saw a UAZ police vehicle, the investigators chose not to check all such police cars in the city. Perhaps, if they had, they would have captured the killer earlier. DNA samples from potential suspects were collected in alphabetical order. Three more years passed. In the spring of 2012, going in alphabetical order, the investigators invited Mikhail Popkov for a chat at the precinct. The man was thin and tall, but otherwise nondescript, and had worked in the police as an operations duty officer until 1999. He readily allowed the investigators to take a sample of his DNA. Soon afterward, he went out into the countryside to visit his mother. Next up was a trip to the far eastern city of Vladivostok, where he was involved in acquiring Japanese cars for resales in Russia. Mikhail Popkov was born in Norilsk, a city known for its natural resource extraction industry. There are plenty of secret plants there as well, by the way, which is why Norilsk is still an area that cannot be freely visited by foreign citizens. You can't just drive into the city on a whim. At first, Mikhail lived in Norilsk with his grandparents but at some point, he moved to Ungarsk, where he got a job in the local police department. Co-workers called him Misha the Smile 
for his friendliness. However, not everyone treated him with unconditional affection. To some people, Mikhail seemed very greedy, ready to do literally anything for money. Popkov often curried favor with his superiors and was constantly looking for some kind of part-time job. He had a wife and daughter whom he loved very much. He even had a joint hobby with his daughter Katya. They collected car miniatures. All in all, he seemed an ordinary, decent family man. This image started crumbling in the summer of that year. The Maniac team got the test results back, which showed that Popkov's DNA matched the samples taken at three crime scenes. But there was one issue here. Having worked in the police in the late 90s and early aughts, Popkov would have often visited crime scenes. Could the investigators have made a fatal mistake? To solve this question, they decided to bring Popkov in as quickly as possible. Detective Vasily Domorodov arrived from Novosibirsk. He had long been preparing to catch the Ungar's killer and was ready to represent the interests of the Siberian district, seeing as things finally on track again. On June 24, Mikhail Popkov was apprehended while trying to get on a train back home from Vladivostok. Artem Dubinin, together with a colleague, made the arrest. Popkov had a loaded gun on him. It seems he expected that someone would come after him, but he didn't have the time to use his weapon, as the policeman quickly stepped up close to him from two sides. During the flight from Vladivostok back to Angarsk, the killer stayed silent. At first, he decided to use this tactic during his interrogation, but soon realized that the DNA matches meant he was done for. At this point, he decided to cooperate with the investigation and wrote several confessions involving cases that the police already knew about. In the end, Mikhail confessed to 11 murders, but that wasn't enough. The investigators had registered over 30 similar crimes. In order to confuse the police, Popkov started writing confessions to deeds that couldn't be connected to any of the cases, doing his best to waste their time. The investigators tried to keep themselves from disclosing to Popkov all the facts gathered during the investigation. They were waiting to see if he would confess to something they didn't know yet. By the end of the summer, the Novosibirsk investigator, Domorodov, had changed a lot. Colleagues observed that he used to be pleasant and easy to work with, but at some point, he became more withdrawn and asocial. Some co-workers noticed that Domorodov seemed as he was trying to help the Angarsk maniac reduce his prison sentence. When fall came, Dubinin realized that if Domorodov didn't change his line of behavior, the killer who had plagued all of Angarsk for so many years would only be convicted for three murders and serve 18 years. Popkov was fine with that. He would still be not too old upon his release and could continue his bloody deeds. Popkov's wife, Yelena, started coming to the precinct on a nearly daily basis. She was allowed to visit her husband and eagerly socialize with Domorodov. They were very friendly with each other. Yelena found his company pleasant, often laughed in his presence and used every opportunity to glance into the case documents. She too had changed during the summer months. She used to be mousy and quiet, modest both in dress and behavior, but now she discovered in her a passion for makeovers. Even Popkov himself at some point said to his wife, You, Lena, are looking suspiciously good. Damaradov started staying late at work and soon stopped showing up at the hotel where he was lodged for the duration of the investigation. He was constantly off somewhere talking on the phone with some woman. And one day, Yelena Popkova casually told him right in front of his colleagues that she would be cooking chicken tonight. Dubinin, along with his other colleagues, began to suspect that Domorodov and Popkova were having an affair. But how could one prove it if even finding where a detective spent the night was a challenge? Either sensing something wrong or out of genuine concern for the fate of his wife, one day Popkov asked Dubinin to look after his wife. She was allegedly being threatened by lawyers who were extorting money from her. Artyom went to Popkov's house and saw a light in the window. 
This seemed very strange to him, as Yelena was at work at that time, and their daughter no longer lived with her parents. This meant that theoretically, no one should have been home, who then was in the killer's apartment. Dubinin called Yelena in an attempt to figure out who could be in her apartment, but Yelena yelled at him, demanding the police leave her alone. Such an inadequate response concerned Dubinin, so he called for backup. As bad luck would have it, Damaradov didn't pick up his phone. The lights in the apartment went out as soon as the police cars arrived. Dubinin continued to call Damaradov, insisted on telling his colleague that there was an imposter in the killer's apartment. When the morning came, Damaradov finally picked up the phone and told Dubinin, That's me in that apartment. Thus, the entire investigation department found out where Detective Damarado had spent the night. The latter, however, didn't admit his guilt, instead accusing his colleagues of espionage and trying to get Dubinin removed from his position. However, in the end, it was Damaradov who was suspended after a call came in from a Moscow bigwig. Unfortunately, Damaradov had managed to do a lot of damage to the investigation. By the way, he still denies obstructing justice and having had an affair with the killer's wife. He claims that he and Yelena were just friends. He allegedly felt sorry for the woman who was treated badly by everyone around her. After the incident with the unexpected guest in her apartment, Yelena left for Novosibirsk, while Damaradov lives there to this day. Some witnesses say the two still have a relationship despite the fact that the investigator is married to another woman and has a child. As for Yelena, some believe she knew about the atrocities committed by her husband. This theory is supported by forensics done on one of the bodies, as well as by Popkov's own unofficial confession. Mikhail had said that Yelena was involved in one of the murders, while forensics showed two different kinds of stab wounds on the body of one of the victims, some deeper than the others. It seemed as if some of them were inflicted by an insecure, weak hand. Moreover, the examination showed that the injuries were inflicted by two different knives. Why would Popkov need this? Perhaps he wanted to intimidate his wife, send her a message. If I get caught, you'll be my accomplice. With this, Popkov forced Yelena to keep quiet. The investigators organized a polygraph test for her, but she left in tears before it even began. She had been caught lying before. She once deceived a police officer during an interrogation, providing her husband with a made-up alibi for one of the attacks. Assuming Yelena was not an accomplice in that crime, she was in all likelihood simply not that interested in her husband's life. The perfect family that their neighbors believed them to be was just a pretty facade, behind which were hidden two people long since indifferent to each other. It is known that both Popkov and his wife often cheated on each other. Mikhail only stayed together with Yelena because of their daughter, believing Katya should grow up in a two-parent family. Despite this benevolent wish, sometimes Popkov would wake up in cold sweat and make sure he hadn't accidentally killed his loved ones. At some point, he had nearly strangled Yelena in a bout of anger, only stopping because their daughter had entered the room. There was also a theory voiced on Russian television by one of the killer's former colleagues that Popkov didn't act alone, but had an ex-military man as an accomplice. This version, however, seems rather far-fetched. Popkov was clearly counting on Damaradov's help. He didn't intend to go to prison and was planning to steal a weapon from the guards or kill Dubinin with a pen or pencil. Naturally, when the police found out about these plans, they ramped up surveillance, but it was still somewhat scary to work with the killer knowing such things. Despite all attempts to hush up the case, Popkov received a life sentence. After that, he confessed to 20 more attacks in addition to the 22 he had already been proven. Apparently, he did this because he wanted to be in a pre-trial detention facility, not in prison, since the treatment there was better. Popkov received his first sentence in 2015, 
after which the public interest in his case began to wane. A detective named Korchevsky arrived from Novosibirsk to replace Domorodov. Delving into the case, he got Popkov to confess to 60 more murders in other regions of the country. Thus, Popkov became known as the most prolific serial killer in modern Russian history. According to some sources, he has been responsible for at least 80 murders and confessed to all of them. Recently, in 2018, Popkov was given a second life sentence. He is currently serving in the infamous Black Dolphin prison in the town of Soliletsk in the Orenburg region on the Russian border with Kazakhstan. One of the most sinister and harsh correctional facilities, it is reserved for serial killers and other exceptionally dangerous criminals that have been sentenced to life in prison. There have been rumors that in 2020, Popkov was transferred to a different prison after having confessed to several more murders. But there has been no official confirmation of this. In prison, the killer discovered a passion for reading and receives books for good behavior. He likes talking to the press and giving interviews, but doesn't do it for free. Since his family seems to have broken off all connections to him, this remains his only way of getting money to buy cigarettes, tea and coffee. Popkov's manner of talking is known to be quite strange. He often evades direct answers, instead reciting stories from books, movies and world history, and some topics he avoids altogether, like conversations about his childhood and family. So we have only the occasional word slip to the rare journalist as well as the results of his psychiatric evaluation to give us an idea of what shaped his maniacal personality. Here are some facts from his biography. Since his very childhood, Mikhail's life wasn't a happy one. His parents gave all their affection to his younger sister, wouldn't ever visit him when he went to summer camp, and according to Mikhail himself, indulged in orgies at home. It is of course now impossible to corroborate his words. Later, he felt betrayed by his girlfriend, who had found herself another man by the time Mikhail returned from military service. He recounts one particular episode in the year 1992 that drove him especially mad. Upon returning home from work, he found their daughter hanging around outdoors and having glanced into the garbage bin at home, discovered two bottles of beer and a used condom. All these things, Mikhail claims, became the bricks that built his criminal portrait. It was his wife's cheating that allegedly prompted him to commit his first murder. The killer wanted to rid the world of fallen women, a desire for which the press nicknamed him the Ungar's Cleaner. If a woman got into his car and simply asked for a lift home, he usually abstained from attacking, but agreeing to his proposition of continuing the evening in his company and with alcohol was as good as signing one's own death warrant. Popkov alleged that upon arriving in a secluded place, the women would start undressing and offering themselves sexually to him. Popkov successfully managed to lead a double life. At one point, he gruesomely murdered a teacher from his daughter's school and then gave money for the burial when the student's parents were asked to help out. Popkov said he didn't get any pleasure from the killings. The first one happened at the level of reflexes and afterward, he just rolled with it. The investigators that worked with him, however, have a different point of view. They recall how the killer would become transformed when talking about his murders. A spark would appear in his eyes, and his palms would go sweaty. Popkov himself claims to stop his killing spree in 2007-2010. This may be true, the police indeed stopped discovering bodies during this period. But the investigators believe the truth might be somewhat different. The thing is that Popkov often went out to the Far East for the car resales business, and we don't know what happened during those trips. There are still suspicions that Popkov's victim toll might be much higher, though even by current calculations, he has already outdone the infamous Andrei Chikatilo, who had murdered 40 people. Maniacs are not known for stopping their killing sprees, and anyway, why stop if things were going so well? Thankfully, 
this horrible series of murders was finally ended. And what happened to the other participants of the investigation? We know that Artem Dubinin, the man who caught Popkov, is now retired. He has grown weary of solving crimes in Russia and all the stonewalling that goes on in the force even after the perpetrator has been caught. Perhaps Popkov really did want to go down in history. But even more than that, he wanted to kill. And no number of metaphorical bricks is enough to justify his horrific crimes. Share your thoughts on this story. How did the maniac manage to stay under the radar for so long? Why wasn't he caught earlier? Subscribe to my channel so as not to miss any of my new videos. And check out my other channel where I tell stories about ill-fated mountain ascents and other disastrous incidents that happened out in nature. Stay safe.